Hello and welcome to this uh, interview for the SLSA 2023 uh, History and Theory Book Prize. We're here with our prize winner, uh, Sharon Thompson, whose book is entitled Quiet Revolutionaries, the Married Women's Association and Family Law. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Alex Green, and I am a senior lecturer at the University of York. Sharon Thompson is, of course, a reader at the School of Law and Politics at the University of Cardiff. Sharon, hi. Nice to talk hey. to you. You too. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So um, let's get stuck in and talk about the book. So you describe uh, Quiet Revolutionaries as an exercise in feminist legal history. What is distinctive um, about this approach, do you think? And why does this distinctiveness matter? So would you characterize uh, feminist legal history, for example, uh, as an instance of uh, history from below? Or is it something else altogether? Um, I think that's a really good question in terms of whether I'd consider it to be history of below or not. With the Married Women's Association, they were uh, a group established at the end of the 1930s. And their work was sort of a history from below in terms of the people they represented, certainly, and the work that they did. So the people they represented were housewives, they were um, deserted wives uh, who were left very, very economically vulnerable because the law didn't do enough to protect them and they were seeking to reform the law. And in terms of their work, I think that's also a sort of history from below because it's looking at reform, reform from a different angle. So, you know, um, we typically talk about law reform in terms of, you know, precedent being formed in the courtroom and legislation being passed. Um, but this instead is about a pressure group and how they sought to reform the law. Um, so I um, was sort of drawn drawn to this as an exercise in feminist legal history, because I think looking at this from a kind of bottom up approach, we can take a, an alternative look at how law is reformed. Um, it can give us a different appreciation, I think, of how law came to be as we know it, uh, how law reform is sort of shaped by these failed attempts. That the, the group was often unsuccessful in their attempts at reform, um, but they were still behind the scenes having these background con conversations that were nevertheless influential. Um, and in terms of it being an exercise in feminist legal history, I think that was part of your, your question as well. I think it challenges our understanding of, of our understandings of the past, um, because it's also um, confronting conventional notions of law reform um, by looking to ask, well, why do we know more about groups like the Married Women's Association? Why have they been excluded from stories of law reform for so long? And often that's because our notions of, of what successful law reform looks like um, are very much based on the act that passed the successful case. Um, so I think as academics, um, when we think about law reform and taking a feminist approach, it's also really interesting to challenge those notions of success and failure and in doing that also challenge our notions of like what actually counts as law reform in the first place. Well, that's fascinating. Now, it's it's really interesting that um, immediately um, the question of law reform pops up there, because um, of course the title of the book and one theme running through it is the potentially revolutionary nature of law reform, um, and mm -hmm. as your last answer implied, also incremental uh, law reform. Now. Mm -hmm. When I first read the book, um, I found this quite counterintuitive um, because you tend to think of reform and revolution as being two very different things. But as I progressed through your analysis of the Married Women's Association, I was struck by you know, how ambitious their aims were in their historical context. Um, and all of this put me in mind perhaps uh, of the ship of Theseus, 
you know, that famous thought experiment. So when all the boards of family law have individually been changed by incremental reform, can we really consider ourselves as sailing in the same ship? Um, and maybe it is revolutionary after all, right? Um, so yeah, just how, yeah. yeah, just how revolutionary do you think the Married Women Association really was um, in relation to family law? Um, yeah, I I think that word a bit provocative in the title because it often is associated with that kind of impactful, um, often militant methods. You know, um, uh, the Married Women's Association often compared itself to the, the suffragettes and their newsworthy strategies, and and they weren't like that. They they described themselves as uh, you know quite self deprecating way as being chicken hearted compared to to the suffragettes. Um, but so they weren't necessarily revolutionary in their tactics, as you say, there was a kind of incremental step by step approach. And I think from that point of view, the title might seem a little bit uh, peculiar. Uh, putting it in context, though, they were operating at a time when, um, you know, the universal suffrage had only just been achieved in 1928. And so you're looking at members of that group who for the first time are being able to participate in, in Parliament. So they had very early woman MPs as some of the, the leaders of the group, such as Edith Summerskill, she was their first president. Um, very early woman lawyers who for the first time were able to, to practice as solicitors and barristers. And so it would be, uh, in their view, um, uh, nonsensical to spur methods of trying to work within processes and try to achieve change that way. But then when trying to achieve law reform as feminists, of course, um, revolution is just not an option because um, the parameters of reform, of course, are set by those in power and the Married Women's Association are trying to fit within those parameters. And I think that's why there's often so much um, ambivalence amongst feminist scholars as to whether or not, you know, we should seek to reform the law with it within the law or, or whether we should do something else. And um, so as a result, like many feminist groups, the story of the Married Women's Association is one of compromise. It is one of incremental reform. And from that point of view, you know, revolutionary might not be the best word. But as I came to look at their ideas within context, uh, I did think that what they were doing was quite radical. And what I try to bring out in the book is this notion that the association was, was pioneering in its demands for women's work in the home to be valued economically. So they're operating in a context where, for example, if woman if a woman is left uh, permanently disabled during World War II, the law initially said that any compensation for those injuries would go to their husband because it was their husband who needed to pay for another housekeeper. So the law is literally treating women as servants. And the Married Women's Association is reeling against those ideas and saying something quite groundbreaking, which is that um, women should have a right to the income coming into the home, that they should have a right to their husband's property during marriage, that that should be the property of the, of the marriage, of the relationship. Um, and that, that that was really you know, necessary because women's emancipation in the home is directly linked to other issues outside the home like equal pay and um and it's part of a broader kind of um uh, um i guess landscape of of looking to how to improve the law for women um so yes i think i i think that um they are revolutionary and their ideas there they're revolutionary you know conceptually in that sense um their ideas uh in terms of politically uh politicizing this relationship between men and women and the family politicizing the private sphere um a lot of things that the married women's association did were later you know um continued by the women of the movement and often ignored when when we look at um at 
uh, feminist history. So um, that's what I was trying to get at there with, with the, the revolutionary part of it. And then the quiet bit, of course, relates more to their more um, uh, their, their methods that were, I guess, uh, less revolutionary and more about working within processes to try and um, influence and achieve change. Mm. That's really interesting. So there's this there's this sense of ordinary politics having an amazing potential, and there's a there's almost a um, uh, a mirroring there. You know, their methods being the the sort of more ordinary political lobbying rather than a sort of suffragette style approach, and at the same time politicizing those things that now you know from the perspective of feminist theory we take to be sort of political all the way down, you know, the family, the home environment, as you say. So, yeah, I mean, the, I started off at a, when I was reading the book and I was like, oh, gosh, I mean, you know, the, the, this revolutionary thing, it's its a title hook. But uh, I, you genuinely persuaded me, you know, um, and it, the, the neglect that ordinary political actors like that have in a lot of history is incredible. Um, which brings me to, to a connected uh, question. So in the book, you talk in places uh, about the contemporary relevance of the political lobbying done by the Married Women's Association. Um, now, I think that's likely to strike a tone with many socio-legal scholars, you know, in our audience. Um, in light of the modern emphasis in uh, the Academy on impactful research. So do, do you think that there's anything that we can learn? Um, from the Married Women's Association, both as citizens, um, but also uh, as publicly engaged academics. So you mentioned that they characterize themselves as, you know, sort of quiet but persistent. So do you think that theirs is a model to build on in general and perhaps for us in particular? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, actually, about whether they provide a model to build upon. Um, I'm not sure that they're kind of a good blueprint for reform so much as a good case study of what to expect to come up against when pursuing uh, legal change with feminist aims and in that sense I think those are the sorts of lessons that can be learned from and, and that's uh, you know my view what makes the the Married Women's Association story interesting from the point of view of a you know, socio-legal scholar um, I think, you know, first of all, um, as I've already said, it's it's that notion of looking at um, who is in power and how you want, how you can, you know, approach law reform as an outsider to those power structures and how you, to be mindful of that. Um, you know, for these, these frameworks of reform that don't allow for feminist alternatives. So what do you do if you want to pursue feminist reform? Um, and, and and looking to that, that goes back, I think, to this um, problem of incremental reform and sometimes just the fact that a step by step approach is necessary um, and is, in fact, the only option. And in spite of, you know, the vast amount of academic criticism of piecemeal or, or ad hoc reform. Um, and that was a strategy that wasn't initially pursued by the Married Women's Association. They were wanting to achieve, um, a, you know, really comprehensive reform, really quite ambitious reform in terms of changing married women's property rights more holistically. But that they just weren't getting anywhere with that for decades and decades. Um, but where they did get somewhere was um, influencing that more piecemeal legislation, which nevertheless was gradually changing the conversation around married women's property rights. And it was it was um, an influence that they didn't uh, get credit for because, you know, maybe they drafted the original bill, but that bill wasn't successful, but then it was taken forward by another politician or, you know, it's, it's those sorts of processes that operate to I guess, mask the work that's really happening. Um, and um, I think that that could be encouraging for us in terms of thinking about the impact of our work and that, um, you know, it's not about um, 
necessarily like spearheading reform and it going through and it all being successful but it is those more subtle influences that can nevertheless be really really important um and i think that's that goes back again to you know challenging what we count as success what we count as law as law reform and i guess you know to link to your your question what counts as impact as well because of course within um you know, academia, there are very precise definitions as to what does and doesn't count as impact. And I think looking at the legal history of feminist, arguably, um, impact should be looked at differently because it's not just about saying, you know, um, our research influenced this reform that was ultimately successful. It's it's also the stuff that isn't successful that down the line might change something in a more subtle way mm. um so um I, I, yeah i'm not sure that answers your question in terms of whether or not it's a model to build upon but i think those are the sorts of lessons that um you know are useful to think about when we talk about reform today no, thank you yeah i mean i, I completely agree and it really struck a chord with me when I read it because I you know as a slightly uh younger scholar I remember and as a theorist in particular you sort of think oh well I'm going to have this picture of how I want the world to be and then I'm just going to try and persuade people that's right which of course never works <laughs> um and it, it's quite a that discovery is quite a sobering experience and seeing these um uh more subtle, sort of quiet and persistent approaches having um, a diffuse effect on the yeah. political ethos is actually quite inspiring. Yeah. Um, you know, e yeah. even if you don't agree with every single step along the way, right? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, and there was often lots of stuff that, that you know, <laughs> you know wouldn't be advisable all of the all of the infighting all of the kind of relative chaos within the group at times but then you know to go back to your example of your theoretical approach um it it might be that the name of your theory isn't sort of taken forward explicitly in a case but that a judge is influenced by something you've said and just an element of that approach is ultimately going to influence something in, in a different way and so I think absolutely like talking about things from different perspectives, different theories can be, you know, really impactful in a way that maybe isn't acknowledged as much as it should be. Excellent. Look, well, there are obviously many reasons to read this wonderful book, but, but one reason I think in particular is that um, it's uh, presented in quite an original way for for an academic work, because in addition to your 10 chapters, um, some of which explicitly engage in, in group biography as well as history, you have these very interesting four interludes which provide context and flavor. And for me, um, first as a casual and then as a closer reader, um, this made the text really engaging. So as a historian, I guess what I wanted to ask you is, do you see yourself as a storyteller as well as a scholar? Um, well, I think all of our scholarship as legal academics involves storytelling, doesn't it? Because, you know, especially when we're talking about reform historically, because that's how we make sense of what happened. Um, especially in a broader sort of socio-legal context, we need to engage with these things. Um, with the with the interludes, uh, so I did a lot of work in the archives uh, for this book, and um, I was really struck when I was reading the records of the Married Women's Association how the voices of the members of the group were often just so strong and so strident, and sometimes that's difficult to convey in an um, conventional chapter through a quote here and a quote there so that was one of the things I wanted to bring through in the book was you know here's who these people were and I want to give you a sense of who these people were and as a result this is why there's this interlude where it's you know an entire speech 
made by the vice chairman in 1958 because that really gives you a sense of the tone of what they were about of who these people were um and in addition to that i've got extracts of letters from housewives who uh, were being helped by the association and what their stories were and i try to start every chapter with i want those voices to come through as 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 part of understanding um, what this group was about um, and really to give a sense of who they were. Um, I'm not I'm not sure what that means in terms of storytelling, but that was certainly my motivation anyway, with the with the interludes and with the the introductory passages. It's good to hear that because you know it as a reader it obviously makes the book more engaging and immersive, but it, it's it's uh, wonderful when that sort of skill of writing and presenting the material dovetails with uh, a sort of a genuine scholarly purpose like this. So, I mean, you know, obviously we awarded your book the prize, so we can't sing its praises enough. Um, but that's uh, that's one thing I would particularly r recommend to our um, audience in relation to it. It's just very good fun to read. Um, oh, thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> so, look, um, my last question, uh, Sharon, really on behalf of our audience now is where do we go to find out more about this wonderful book? Um, so the book is published by Heart and it's coming out in paperback at the beginning of March. Um, but in addition to that, uh, there's a website connected to the book, which is uh, marriedwomensassociation.co.uk. And that's got information about other resources. So, you know, for instance, if you wanted to hear um, the, so, so as part of the book, I should have said, I also interviewed people connected with the group. Um, and I have got some of the extracts from the interviews that I put into a podcast. And I've sort of told the story of the Married Women's Association through this podcast as well. Um, and that podcast is called Quiet Revolutionaries, same as the book. And it's available on all the kind of podcast platforms wherever you get them. But it's also linked on that website. Perfect. Well, there you are, folks. Available at all good podcast uh, retailers near you online. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon, thank you so much uh, for chatting uh, with me today. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, again, uh, everybody watching, I can only recommend the text in the strongest possible terms. Um, so go and read it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Alex. <laughs> <laughs>